Um, so Ava, you specialise in verbatim theatre for young audiences or with young audiences, I guess. Um, and for anybody that's unfamiliar with the term verbatim, I suppose a good place to start would be able to describe that if you'd be able to, but then also tell us a little bit about your work within that field, if that's okay. Yeah. So really verbatim is about, uh, it's it's a Latin term and it means literally to take someone's words, um, to take their truth. And um I mean, it, it, historically, its roots are kind of back in the 60s, really, where people like Peter Cheeseman um, recognised that a lot of the stories in theatre that were being told were a, a particular class of, of people um, and um, a, a particular community. So he was very interested in, in working class voices Um and, uh, you know, over the years, lots of different practitioners have, have dabbled with verbatim, like people like David Hare and Max stafford Clark, uh, just a couple that have come, come to mind. But it was also, it's also very popular in, in Australia and New Zealand, you know, so around the world. And America, of course, the Lame project is obviously something, you know, that, that particular project is very famous. Um, but I started working using verbatim material back in 2009 um, and I was researching the story of a woman called Irena Sendler um, and she was someone who had her own story was, was buried um, and when it came to light um, there was lots of material there that um, made a fascinating story. And I was able to talk to someone who had met her and who had known Lily. Sorry, her name is Lily Pullman, but uh, who had known Irena. Um, and so we were able to, to take that material and, and construct a, a theatre piece around her story, but also the story of Rachel Corey. So Irena Sendler was a, a Polish woman who um, lived in um, Warsaw. Uh, she was Catholic and she was living in Warsaw. She was a social worker at the time of the Nazi invasion. And she was responsible for saving two and a half thousand Jewish children from the ghetto and renaming them, giving them new identities and placing them with Christian families. Um, and then, as I say, her story became completely obscured um, because after the war, uh, the collapse of uh, Poland and then the Poland becoming part of the Eastern Bloc, she, she, because she was aligned with the Polish resistance, um, Zagota, uh, she was again a threat to the state. So again, her story was obscured. The other woman uh, whose story I, I took um, some of verbatim is Rachel Corey, and she had written her diaries. And obviously, um, Alan Rickman had uh, very famously taken Rachel Corey's story and made a play called I Am Rachel. Um, so we combined those two stories together. Um, and then just to, to fast forward, really, um, then another big project that I did last last year was the story of Saad al Kassab, who was this young Syrian refugee. And we, we worked very closely with Saad um, and made his uh, story available to young people in, in Derbyshire um, and about his journey from, from Syria into the refugee camps in Lebanon and Egypt, and then to rebuild his life in Melbourne in Australia. And again, I think that that is a story that needed to be told. Um, I think in the last four years, since the really the Brexit vote, um, young people, but also mainstream media have very much kind of focused on immigration and, and um, uh, refugees in in a kind of a very sort of threatening kind of way and to hear the real story of someone um, 
I think is a really important counterpoint to that, to those narratives. Yeah. And once you've, how do you actually go about collecting these real stories? Like what are the practicalities of finding people to interview, actually then conducting the interview? And once you've got these stories, how do you then begin the creative process of weaving them into a narrative or a performance? Well, um, it's through a range of different ways. I mean, sometimes you're writing material down, you're writing things down. Sometimes you're recording it and then you're transcribing it. Um, but I mean, I think the, notoriously uh, the Baton Theatre has a little bit of a, a kind of, um, it has a lot of criticism in as much as I think if it stays too rigidly to then I did this, then this happened, then this happened, there's a, it, it, it lacks a theatricality. And I think that, you know, therefore, if you look at people like Max Stafford Clark and, and David Hare in particular, it's how as an artist, you use that material to construct a dramatic structure to, and, and theatricalize that to make a piece of theater. Um, it's not enough just to, 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 to record and to write stuff down and then just to put that on its feet. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, that's where the interesting part comes. So again, you know, for like acting alone, um, I was interviewing, well, I say I was interviewing, I was talking to a young soldier, a young um, Israeli uh, soldier who was from Birmingham. Um, and I kind of was, um, you know, I, I, so I, I, I kind of recorded it in my head almost. And then I kind of went back and quickly kind of wrote down as much as, as I could remember. And there were key phrases that he used. Um, so sometimes, you know, you're, you're kind of given a gift like that really I mean I I'm I'm not sure that you know if I had tried to find an Israeli soldier from Birmingham I don't know, I don't know what, what the chances were of that yeah and I just want to say I, I went back for this interview and watched um, the most recent version of Acting Alone um, at Nottingham Playhouse and it's actually on YouTube for anybody that's interested um, and I highly recommend you know that you go and watch that um I just thought you did such a superb job of creating these characters and telling their stories and also then counteracting that with your own story, actually Ava's story within that entire madness of a trip and an expedition. Um, and I thought that the storytelling was absolutely brilliant. You did such a superb job of weaving those two things together and presenting it in the way that you did. And it almost, to me, felt, I just, I could see vividly how strong of an impact theatre and education has had on you as a practitioner and, and your work within it. Um, yeah, yeah, it was, I thoroughly enjoyed the performance, thoroughly enjoyed the show. Yeah, I think with acting alone, it, it, it... Acting alone was, was, was very different because it, it, it not only has it got elements of verbatim in it, but of course it's all, it's autobiographical as well. Um, and then you're also looking at such a complicated political um, question, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which is so um, alienating for so many people and so controversial in terms of people's opinions and positions in, in the, the, you know, the for and against. And then, as I say, I think there is a significant number of people who are completely alienated from it because they think, well, I can't have an opinion on this because it's just too complicated. So, uh, and then who am I to have an opinion on it? You know, and I, so I think that that whole thing about putting yourself in the story and, and vocalising those fears um, was really kind of central to, to acting alone. 
and then kind of intersecting it with the traditional stories as well was um was a trying to I was trying to kind of almost kind of kind of come out of the whole thing and try and look at a bigger picture um, um, and try and invite the audience to consider conflict um, and um, how we understand things from from a completely um, different perspective. Have have any of the people that you've interviewed ever seen your work and seen and, or maybe noticed that something that they've shared with you, you've used? And have they ever, I don't know, commented or what has their feedback been potentially? Yes. Um, well, my, obviously the people that um, were part of those stories were aware that I was using um, their words or referring to them. So Maggie Ford, for instance, who directed uh, I'm No Hero and The Kites Are Flying was with me in Palestine and she was aware that I would be referencing her and um, our our experience and she came along to see the show and she was um, absolutely delighted with it and ref felt that it reflected very much the experience that we had had in Palestine but protecting the anonymity of people whose stories they share uh, with me is very important so another project that I worked on was called Real For Me which was about um, interviewing young people and their experiences of using um, their words and, and accounts of how social media is impacting on relationships. So in that uh, project, um, their voices were recorded, um, the work was transcribed, um, sections of those transcripts were um, edited, and then we used that um, recording to play into the actors' ears um, section by section, and then the actors would speak speak those words. So that use of verbatim material is, is, is another uh, practice, but the young people who shared their stories with us were completely anonymous. Um, is that something you would explain to somebody when you're interviewing them when you're beginning this process so how would you actually go about asking somebody or explaining to somebody that you are potentially going to use their story I guess yeah well with, with Saad for instance you know um, Saad was very and his family were very involved in, in, in the script in the development of the script um, and they they asked for things to be changed and Craig made those changes um, and then when I so like for instance the scene in Journeys of Destiny where we see the children um, reenacting with the actors um, a moment in the refugee camp I just felt that that whole moment and and that you know, they, they spent two or three years in a refugee camp. There's no school, there's no work, they had no money. Um, Saad's youngest sister was was ill and they it cost a fortune to get to get um, medication for her. Um, and um, I felt that that needed to be kind of sort of animated a little bit more just to kind of go, oh, and then we were in a refugee camp and, 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 then, and then we got out. I, I felt it was really important. So Saad and I had a, a, an additional conversation about that and and I made notes uh, based on what he said. And then we, we created a, a kind of a, uh, almost like a kind of a, a summary, if you like, <laughs> little kind of montage. Um, and uh, and then he saw he he did manage to, so and that production was filmed and then he saw that production. Um, but yes, I think the whole process of of allowing people like you're asking me, you know, you're saying to me, you know, to to, to if I'm happy with with how this interview goes, that whole process is really important. Um, 
It is hard. It is really yeah. hard. Yeah. And where do you think the benefits are of using verbatim theatre for creating theatre for young audiences or with young people? Where do you see the value in that process? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that, that, that young people, when we were doing Journeys of Destiny, I think that young people felt, you know, they were not only just listening to the story or watching the story, but some of the young people were embodying the story too and acting alongside the professional actors. And certainly, you know, so the whole thing about this is a true story, this is a true story, I think it helps to really uh, appreciate and understand and em and build empathy um, with the person. So some of the young people would say things like, I'm really happy that Saad is in a safe place now. Um, they were really, really shocked. I remember we were up in North Derbyshire and we also had an actor in the in the cast uh, who also was a Syrian refugee. And so, you know, when the children said, well, but is it, does it really happen? Would the government really shoot children? For them, that was an impossible concept. And when the actor in the piece said yes you know and i grew up in syria and this was happening around me suddenly there's a kind of a gravi gravitas to that moment and the impact was was huge and i remember the, the teacher coming up to us at the end and saying you know the children really need to hear stories like this they live in such a bubble so the concept that somewhere else in the world, you know, there are governments that shoot children, um, it's just so important. Yeah, and the fact that they are verbatim case taken from, you know, the truth just adds so much more weight yes. to, to the performance, doesn't it? Which is, yeah, which is a massive, massive thing. Also... Yeah. As well, Ava, something that I just want to ask you about. Acting Alone was a one-woman show. How was that process? Being by yourself, without oh, a company? It was, it was, I think because of the nature of the story, as I say, you know, looking at that conflict, it, I never knew what was going to happen. And um, sometimes I would be heckled. Um, sometimes people would come up to me after the show and say, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I don't believe this would happen. And they were adamant. Um, and then someone else would come up and say, uh, well, I'm a barrister and, and, and I've, and you know, I, I'm a test, I can testify to that these stories are true. Um, so there's a moment in the show where, um, the soldier from Birmingham says that the only time he ever has to cop his gun at someone is at the settlers. And, and this person just said, no, no, that would never happen. That would never happen. And this barrister said, yeah, no, it does. It does happen. Um, um, and also, you know, why, why would, you know, he wasn't lying to me. He wasn't, you know, making it up to impress me. Um, So I, I, it was always, there was, it was always terrifying really, because I never knew how people were going to react. So were you traveling alone? Were you arriving at venues by yourself or did you have a, no, just by yourself? So it, it, you're smiling. It takes, it, it takes me back to that wonderful anecdote in the show where you talk about yourself and Michael turning up to libraries and doing the, the storytelling workshops very different to that process then, very different. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think with, with I'm No Hero and, and the Kites Are Flying, because they had all this projected um, video um, uh, archive footage and, 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 and filmed, uh, commissioned film, and I was kind of interacting with it and stuff, um, 
acting alone was a, was very much about stripping everything away. So in acting alone, I I, I didn't I had just had a chair and a table, um, and and hardly any props at all, and and so all the changes, character changes, uh, changes in time, location were all done through music, lighting, and and my performance and. Yeah, just turning up at a venue with just yeah a, a script um, and a, and you know like a suitcase of, of, of stuff and then going through each show uh, with a technician, a new technician at every show, um, just to kind of go through those the sound cues and the lighting cues. What was difficult sometimes was 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 looking at the lighting states. <laughs> kind of trying to be in it and having lights focused and stuff and then I'd have to kind of try and come out and look at it and realizing oh actually you know this is a little bit more complicated than just rocking up um and and it was hard sometimes so it was produced entirely by yourself as well yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and Tilly Branson, who directed it, she would come out to some shows. I do remember one show. I have to tell you this. I remember because because it, it's very circular. The, the you know how the stories are constructed. I'm going backwards and forwards the whole time. And um, I think I hadn't done the show for a, a week or two or something. And then um, I was doing it, and Tilly was in the audience. And I and I suddenly I was in the middle of a speech. And I suddenly had this out of body experience where my brain suddenly went, you've missed a whole section out. And my heart started pounding and, and I'm carrying on in the scene, you know, doing it all. And then there's this part of my, my brain that's going, bloody hell Ava. Oh my God, because at the end, everything all connects up. You know, every word practically that I've said all connects up. And I'm thinking, shit, if I haven't said these words and then I haven't used these phrases, nothing will make any sense. And my heart, literally, I just was going, oh, my God. Oh, my God, I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I, what have I left out? When did I leave it out? While still being in the scene and doing it all. And, and I got to the end and I went, no, I, I didn't leave anything out. No, it, it was all fine. But I suddenly realised that that was actually the story. That is the story. You know, what if I get it wrong? What if I forget my lines? So that anxiety and that panic was exactly the story that I was telling, except I was actually feeling it in that moment, terrified that I had forgotten something. So it was a really, really... And, of course... As a one-person show, what can you do? I mean... Yeah. And how long How long were you touring that show for? I toured it for... Uh, well, I, I did the very first show, the, the pilot, at the Amnesty... Inter, uh, the Worksworth Festival at Amnesty International in September 2014. And I finished it in its final form uh, at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival in August 2016. So there were gaps in it where we really worked. Yeah. Yeah. And am I right in saying that your work with Acting Alone then went on to shape your research for your PhD? Yes, so that's what I'm writing up right this minute, um, which I should be finishing by by Christmas. Yeah, so essentially what it what all three pieces, I'm No Hero, The Kites Are Flying and Acting Alone, it is all about the bystander um, and why, as a bystander, why would you cross over that line? Why would you risk your life to save someone that you, you don't know? Um, so Irene Sendler was sentenced to death twice, once by um, the Gestapo and, and then uh, once by the communists. Um, and the KGB, uh, and she escaped both times, although she was tortured, she had both her, aunt, her legs and, and feet uh, were broken, 
and then with obviously with Rachel Corey, she was tragically killed. Um, the uh, Israeli Defence Force just rolled a, a bulldozer over her, and um, so that whole notion of, 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 of you know taking a stand and making a difference and contributing to stand up for someone else, someone else's oppression. And I think it's very interesting, you know, this year, I think uh, with, with COVID and with George Floyd and the, the, the Black Lives Matter protests that we've seen ricochet around the world. I think the whole thing about validity and, 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 and protest, I mean, Martin Luther King talks about the protests that happened in, in the 60s. And he talks about that, that really that, that it was only when the white community joined the black protests that, that the movement started to gain some traction. And, you know, so that whole point about where there comes a tipping point for social change, I'm really interested in. I believe, well, we can see, can't we, at the moment, you know, we live in a very divided world. Um, we live in, in a very divided country. We look at America, it's incredibly divided. You've got the far right, you've got the far, far left. But that centre ground, it seems to me, is where there is the most opportunity to make a difference. And for if those people in the, di in the middle are, are, feel that they, that, that they have a contribution that can make a difference, if they feel that that they can participate in something that can create a tipping point, then I believe that is how social change, you know, real social change can be accomplished. And, and, and that's what I'm interested in really. Um, so in schools, I will often use forum theatre um, where we're looking at the bullied person or the bully, but I'm also looking at the bystanders. I never, and, 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 and I'm never encouraging people as, as the bystander to put themselves into a position where they are risking their own well-being. But through forum and through looking at how we could make different um, interventions at different points, we can align ourselves with the bullied person rather than through our silence be complicit with the actions of the bully. And that again is 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 a you know a, a very kind of famous um, quote from Martin Luther King when he says you know in the end it, it's not the, the the words of our enemies we will remember it's the silence of our friends and 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 for me that 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 quote is is just sort of at the heart of, of, of everything that I'm interested in. So if if in forum theatre we have the protagonist and we have the antagonist, the oppressed and the oppressor, then where is the bystander? And I'm and in the PhD, I'm, what I'm looking at is the activation and the animation of the bystander, or what, or as as um, uh, Sophocles says, is it, it, it's the the, the tritagonist the third person on stage who uh, can contribute to changing um, the power structure. How do the young people that you work with engage with the, how do the young people that you work with engage with the forum model? Oh, I, I think that, uh, I think it's incredibly in, in empowering. I think that, um, you know, that opportunity where you're trying something out in the safety of the theatre space is, um, is really important. I mean, I remember once um, we were doing um, a forum where we were looking at transition, um, where young uh, year six uh, pupils had come to the secondary school for a transition day. Um, and we looked at a scene where uh, someone is, you know, being a bit bullish. And this young girl, uh, she was in a little gingham uh, dress, her school uniform, stood up and, and ran out during that scene uh, in tears. And uh, 
I was thinking, oh my God, this is awful. She's obviously, you know, really, this scene has really resonated with her. And, you know, for the rest of the scene, I was kind of going, oh my God, oh my God, you know, I hope she comes back. I hope she's okay. You know, this has obviously triggered something, you know. Anyway, uh, we carried on with the workshop um, and this young girl came back into the uh, hall and I was so pleased to see her. And then we set up a forum scene um, where um, we wanted some young people from the audience to join us on stage to make a difference, to, to, to be these bystanders. So we took the classic scene in a dining room, you know, where somebody gets tripped up and they drop their, their dinner in, on the floor. And of course there's, you know, a big eruption. And of course the, bullied, the bully character, you know, enjoys this moment where the bullied person is, you know, having to be on the floor. So we asked some, some, some young people to come up and join us on stage to be in the queue with their trays, you know, and they're all standing there with their trays. And so we replayed the scene. And this girl actually volunteers to, to be in the queue. And I'm kind of going, oh my God, I, got, I, hope, she's, I hope she's going to be okay. So we replay the scene. And of course, she's the one that, that goes straight to the bullied person and helps them pick up their dinner off the floor. And in that moment, I just felt that it was so important that she came back into the room and, and, a, and, a, and a healing thing for her. And she actually helps the bullied person pick up their dinner and then she stands up to the bully and she just says, no. You know, and to be able to act that out, I, I, I you know, even, you know, it, to me, it doesn't matter whether somebody does go on and do that in real life if it's safe or not but that opportunity even within a fictional context to say that and to take action that can't ever be taken away from that young person ever again because they've said that word and they've acted and they now have a lived experience of the heroic archetype in their life and and how big as you say whether that's within the rehearsal or actual real life that role has been fulfilled and yeah. lived for her within that moment. How do the teachers, because I know that you all... And, she, and to say that she's witnessed by that audience too. And there's that as well, you know, it's not just her hearing her words, you know, he, hearing her own speak those words and those actions, but it's the fact that everybody saw her do that. And in a way, I, I kind of wonder whether, again, that gives that strength to her. Sorry. No, it's fine. I just wanted to ask, Ava, I know that you offer your Forum Theatre Mantle of the Expert training to teachers, CPD sessions, also businesses. And I was interested in knowing, do adults react differently to the process than young people? I mean, is there any differences in how they engage or how they react? Um, it's very interesting. Uh I think adults are as perhaps even more um, reticent to participate um, than young people sometimes. Um, I remember sitting in a staff room once at the beginning of the day and, and, and the teachers were coming in. It was for a, 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 a continuing professional development day and as the teachers came in I heard someone saying oh yeah we've got drama to do oh I don't want to be a tree <laughs> it was just so funny it was oh, not, she had no idea I was sat there <laughs> the classic assumption exactly um but of course you know how you set it up and the parameters and the tone that you create to create that safe place where gently and slowly people feel that they are able to enter into the play. And, 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 it, and it is play, um, is so important. You know, if we set the stakes too high, that reticence is gonna, is gonna kick in, of course. Nobody wants to be publicly humiliated. Nobody wants to feel exposed and uncomfortable, whether that's, you know, 
a seven-year-old or you know a 57-year-old it, it doesn't matter and so it, it, it's always about trying to set and create a safe space and but also when when I'm role playing as well with with adults to to say look I'm the one that's in role you know you're just yourself um I, I was doing a role play on 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 Friday actually with um uh, international students and um adults you know um and uh they they had they had to deal with somebody who was very very upset and I played the, the person who was really really upset and when we get when we got to the end, oh were you, were you really crying were you really crying and and it's like well no I, I wasn't really crying but if you believed in that moment that I was really upset and I needed your help and you made that intervention then that's what we've explored you know pedagogically in that moment um and and so I think your your ability to be able to act and play and create a tone where people are able to suspend their disbelief um, and engage is what creates those those powerful learning opportunities. Yeah, when it comes to the consultancy and CPD work, throughout your time now delivering those sessions, what have you found? that bosses or managers are are asking for the most for their staff to receive what is it about human interaction what part of human interaction is it that they are asking you to come in and in some way rehearse with their staff it, very often it's difficult conversations you know um i think that managers are sometimes petrified of saying something or having a difficult conversation with someone and that that person gets upset or they get really angry. And there's a moment at which if we're having a difficult conversation with someone and that person becomes really angry or really upset, the emotions kick in and it gets out of control, then the manager or whoever it is, you know, uh, becomes incredibly intimidated and afraid because now everybody's outside of their comfort zone and things are, you know, yeah, getting out of control. And that's what they're afraid of. So if we can act that out and rehearse that and give feedback on that, and if I can say, as the upset person or the angry person, I can say, when you said this, this was the impact that it had on them. When you did this, this is what helped or this is what made the situation even harder for us to resolve, then I'm giving really powerful and um, insightful feedback to that person. And because they have had the opportunity to rehearse it, some of that fear starts to, to go down. You know, once we've had the chance to rehearse something, we feel more able to... Um, be able to yeah resolve things have you ever encountered the uh the scale tip the other way where a participant's frustrations have actually manifested and been directed towards you within the drama itself or the role play itself and how as a facilitator have you had to have you managed that because that must be to suddenly take on to to see somebody's frustrations personified in you um no, I mean, I do remember I was doing some work with a care home, with, with this uh, care home uh, once, and this person had not elected to be there of their own choice. They were told to be there. And they were so afraid Um and their fear was manifesting as anger. And when we went round at the beginning and kind of checked in, you know, which is always a great exercise at the beginning, isn't it, of, of, of a drama, you know, workshop, you know, just to check in, find out how people are. I mean, he he basically, he, he did, he used, I don't know, rage or anger or something, and you could see it in his body. And 
I felt, I did feel quite unsafe. Um, and uh, although, you know, the construction of the day's training did take everybody on that journey and in the end, everybody was fine. But that resistance and that reticence and that fear, when it manifests itself as anger, it, it is... I do, re yeah, and I, I remember another time I was working with some unemployed people, uh, long-term unemployed people, it's just come back into my mind. And I remember that it took 45 minutes uh, of, of conversation before we could start the workshop because this person just and the thing is is that when you've got a really strong personality like that in the room it has a contaminating effect everyone kind of goes oh well if he's not doing it I'm not doing it you know and we see that with young young offenders I've worked with young offenders again that fear kicks in um, or with young people in a pupil referral unit, it took me 20 minutes to get them to come down off the top of a bookshelf. I mean, I couldn't even get them to sit in a chair. <laughs> and in those moments, my heart is absolutely pounding. And I'm trying to keep calm. I'm really trying to listen to their fear in that moment, not to make them wrong of having that fear, because I think it's... It, you know, it's um, it's fight or flight, you know. So you're trying to talk to that that frontal cortex rather than the reptilian brain, you know, that's that's triggered that adrenal reaction. But I'm feeling it too. God, yeah. I mean, and and in, in, it's really important to. To not make them wrong, because otherwise, then then you're just setting up an opposition. Then you know, and actually, what I'm always trying to do is trying to align myself that we're batting mm. on the same team. Mm. Do you also train facilitators in foreign practice as well? Yes. Yeah, although it's really hard, it's really hard to to to, to do it because, of course, every forum, every workshop every learning opportunity can be completely different and so you know that's why it's really good to to work in pairs really you know to co co lead or co facilitate um because then you know i think that all of us are vulnerable you know and we, we do make mistakes and and you know uh, afterwards you know, sometimes, you know, we have to forgive ourselves for the mistakes that we made. You know, some, if there are two of you, then there's, there's one person that's looking out for that one child who, that one time, puts their hand up and you miss them. Um, oh, God, you know, that just breaks my heart. You know? <laughs> um, so really looking and really seeing and really being present, I think, is all essentially that we can continue to practice because if we are delivering on our own that's all the faculty we have to fall back on you know to ensure that we that we're making as few mistakes as we possibly can of course we're going to make mistakes but forgiving ourselves is important <laughs> and just to go back to acting alone I, I, I think part of the the dilemma of, of that's at the heart of that show is that I felt that I had made a mistake, that I that I should have stood up in that moment. I should have found some way of articulating what I was thinking or feeling in that moment. Um, yeah. It's hard. It's really hard. Because there is, you know, there's no... You know, training people to, to, to do forum is really, really difficult. Um, I mean, Dave Diamond just talked about it recently in his podcast and talked about how he was working with these um, audience that were um, affected by uh, drug abuse. And um, nobody got up. Nobody would make an intervention. Um, when they got to the end of the forum, nobody would move. 
And it was only, and, and I think at the time they all thought, oh, well, there was something wrong with the forum, but it wasn't. But it was, everybody was so afraid, no one was willing to, to share or disclose their own addictions or, you know. So I think that whole thing about trying to break things down, um, not to beat yourself up if things don't work. Sometimes there are complex reasons why things don't work. Um, you know, it's the same as comedians, isn't it? You know, one night, same material, one night you get a fantastic response, another audience, different response, same material. Yeah. And I still think that's one of the biggest, one of the biggest hurdles that only experience can remedy for trainee facilitators whether that's teacher actors forum facilitators youth theater leaders teachers is that silence isn't always necessarily a bad thing it also gives you the opportunity as the facilitator to reflect on whether or not your process or your question has offered adequate responses or or adequate room for a reciprocal dialogue but I think the biggest thing is getting over what happens when there is no response. What happens when you ask a question to a group and there is silence or you offer something to a group and there is silence? How do you stop yourself from crumbling within that moment? Yeah, and Dorothy Heathcote was was, was great at this. I mean, she never was afraid of the silence and she wanted there to be silences. She felt that, you know, the pace of teaching and everything was far too fast and to slow things down and to give young people the time and the headspace to really think, really think about things was important. But you've got to be brave yourself to hold the space and hold your nerve and um, and trust um, and I think that life is very fast at the moment and answers are immediate now to things that we don't know or we don't understand answers are immediate because they're at the click of a button yeah so mulling things over and giving our Selves time to reflect on things I, and I, I think the difference you know and it's not always easy there's a difference between ruminating and reflecting and sometimes I don't always get it right and um, I can end up in ruminating and go around going around a little bit but reflecting is really important and 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 that's where all of us should or need to be, I think you should have, need to be in terms of continuing to develop our practice. And, you know, people, and particularly students, will say, well, I, I, I'm feeling really nervous, you know, and, I, and, and, and I, I'll say, well, that's good. You know, being nervous means you care. It means you want to get it right. But it also means that, you know, after what we've done today, you're going to be thinking about it and you're going to be thinking in a useful and helpful way about what you could do differently next time. And the day that we stop being afraid and the day we stop taking that time to reflect is the day we should stop because that's when we've stopped learning. And, and I love it the most when I learn from my students and when I learn from the children that we are on a genuine journey of inquiry together. You know, I don't have the answers up my sleeve and they're trying to guess you know what it is um, that's when it becomes the most exciting um, so Ava when you are not reading and researching and compiling your PhD or touring a piece of your own work you lecture at the University of Derby where you're also a scholar as well um, what course is it that you lecture at the University of Derby? Um, I primarily uh, lecture in applied theatre and applied drama practice. Um, and I've been doing that for quite a number of years now. I 
always felt like an imposter, basically, the imposter syndrome, um, because I don't come from that background. That's not who I am, I'm not from a scholarly background. I'm not from an artistic background. Um, so uh, um, I think the whole journey of me um, lecturing and you see, in, when you said the word scholar, I, I pulled a face <laughs> because I just, I still kind of, I don't know, feel a bit weird about that, um, about that term. But anyway, um, yeah, so I, I, I lecture in, in applied theatre and applied drama. And what's really important to me is that um, the students get the opportunity to go out into schools or to go into residential homes or to go into prisons uh, and to work with young people and audiences and, and, and make a contribution. And for me, when the, when the applied work is working at its best, everyone's a winner. You know, the, the, the students are learning, they're making a contribution to that community, to those participants. Um, the university is benefiting from the, the uh, contribution that the university is making to that community. Um, it's a win-win situation and students as a result of those opportunities to deliver work in schools or what have you have actually manifested work opportunities and, 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 and career jobs and things like that have, have come as a result of that. And that feels to me to be so exciting. Um, and, um, and I love it. I love it when, you know, um, students join the, the degree, the undergraduate degree program and, and then at the end of, of the three years, have completely kind of um, just, yeah, seen the value of the work. Um, and the value, the values of the work. Um, and that's, that's, when I, that's when I get the most excited because I can see their passion being turned on and their commitment to wanting to make a contribution, to make a difference. So does the University of Derby support its undergraduate students and postgraduate students because the University of Derby now also has an MA in applied theatre as well? Do you feel that the University of Derby or Derby Theatre does a good job of supporting students with opportunities to develop applied practice or is it just strictly contained within the module or the course itself? No, um, I think that the opportunity for our students to be working in the learning theatre at Derby Theatre is a, an incredible opportunity for our students to see close up and, and, and hands on opportunities of professional practice. So, um, you know, and that goes for the, for the MA too, um, so that, that students can see how it works, and different areas of practice, but within the context of a of a building that has a commitment to creative learning practice, and obviously, you know, over the la over over the years, those um, the, the departments have changed their names. They were originally called theatre and education companies or education departments, um, and they're now called creative learning departments. But I think for our students to be able to see the careers that people have as well and for them to be able to talk to those practitioners um, and, and, those, and, and to find out how uh, the journey that they went on was really, really important. So how is the Masters in Applied Theatre shaped? What are some of the modules that students get the opportunity to study? And also how does that then set them up for their next step? within their career once the 12 months or the part-time 24 months is over? Uh, it, it's very, very practical. So the, the first um, module is, is work-based learning, um, and that's an opportunity for, uh, for our students to really 
gain a deeper insight into professional practice. Um, the lectures there will be uh, introduced to some of the key practitioners and theories, understanding that historical context of the development of the work. Um, in the second semester, there's a, a, a module called Practices Research, so they are creating a piece of work and testing that out as a group. And then the major project, which again is a practice piece, they are creating their own research questions and creating a piece of practical work that will investigate that research question and then presenting that back there. There's only two uh, short essays, so it's it, um, with the major project, it's a viva, where they have to talk about their learning. And then also in addition to that, there are these education modules. And those are really valuable as well because they are thinking about um, educational thinkers and theorists, um, and they're thinking about um, uh, how, uh, people like Paolo Ferreira's um, theories of, of, of learning and education have contributed to people like Augusta Boal's um, Theatre of the Oppressed. Um, and and uh, there are other uh, modules which the students can choose from. So if they are particularly interested in special educational needs, they can specialise in that. If they're interested in working with younger children, they can look at um, childhood development. Um, there are other education modules that look at um, how we develop emotionally and that emotional intelligence. So those education modules really help to underpin the student's practice and the work that they're doing with myself and in the theatre, in the learning theatre, really helps to contextualise that theory through the practice and then uh, one of the uh, aspects that I feel really strongly about is that we really start to think about what it is that uh, students want to achieve once they've got their master's degree. Because for me, it's not just a case of education for education's sake. Um, how are you going to apply this? You know, what are you going to do with it? And how are you going to get there? So um, I'm really interested in, again, um, getting that network, that sense of network and community um, to be a part of thinking. And we are a part of a global community. I think one of the fantastic things that's come out of this COVID-19 is suddenly everyone's going, bloody hell, I, I can communicate with my colleagues in New York. You know, Adrian Jackson's been facilitating these amazing um, discussions with practitioners all over the world. And to interview uh, Julian Boal, Augusta's son, um, about his practice in Brazil and, and the particular challenges that they're experiencing in Brazil at the moment. Um, so that has been so exciting. And I think for our students to realize that they are part of this global um, community it might sound like there's a slight paradox there and bringing those two words together. But it, it and you know, since I've been um, presenting my work um, at conferences internationally, I've realized that there that we are all uh, we're deeply connected through our practice, whether that's in the States, throughout Europe, uh, through Australasia. Um, it's so exciting, Africa, it, it, it's so exciting to be connected through this work um, and that that's what my students are going to be going into and that's where they're coming from as well. So we have students from Japan and America, um, from Hong Kong, um, from Africa, uh, from India, um, so China. So we have people coming, applying for the course from all over the world. And, as I say, that's really exciting to me. Mm. We're coming together and sharing our practice and learning together. But that we are establishing this network um, and that is about our kind of future development and our future employability. And are the interests of the graduates that the course attracts varied? So are there people who are obviously coming to the course from 
different viewpoints and vocations originally or different professions that they want to end up in? How varied are some of the interests of those graduate students? Well, completely. I mean, we've got a symposium that's coming up on Wednesday, the 11th of November. Uh, they are in the afternoon from two o'clock till 5.30. Um, five of our uh, students will be presenting papers. And I think that symposium is an illustration in itself of the diverse interests and areas of practice and theory that the students are interested in. Mm. And that must be really tough as a course leader to be able to offer a programme that is fluent, uh, fluid sorry, to the needs and to respond to the interests of the graduates that your course is attracting? How do you go about maintaining that, but yet still be able to offer a strict framework of academia? Yeah, well, it is a challenge, yes. Um, I mean, one, one of the students has, has got an extraordinary practice in, in, in Blackpool. And, and so, you know, I'm really looking forward to going over to Blackpool and seeing what they're doing um, and, the, and the particular communities um, in, in Blackpool. So I think that as a, as, a, as, a, as a course leader, you know, it's my job to be really putting myself in, uh, in a learning position and really trying to understand as best I can the differences and nuances between the different practices and areas of delivery that all the students are engaged in. And I think that um, yeah, I, I make sure that students are receiving really um, bespoke experiences that come from tutorials and spending time listening and making sure that they are being guided, but also I'm connecting them up with with professionals that might be able to help them. And I think that it's been particularly tough, obviously, this year for everybody um, in this COVID world that we live in. But I'm turning it around and I'm saying <laughs> that, yes, we may have been restricted by the amount of practice that we've been able to engage with. But we are also the kind of the pioneers in a way of trying to work out how we can adapt and um, modify our practices to this new world that we're living in. And it does seem to me that we are being held a, an olive branch at the moment from the Arts Council with the let's create 10 year strategy, that actually this kind of work, flexible work, small, intimate work that can go out into communities and and adhere to um, being socially distanced, but adhere to the requirements of those particular communities does seem to me to be really exciting at the moment and huge potential there uh, until we can all find a way of being able to all come together in a big building again. Um, it seems to me that the the practice that is where the practice is going to have to reside but mm. at the moment is the symposium going to be available to view digitally yes do you know yeah so that's november the 11th that's taking place and, and where will people be able to find that sorry you will it will all be available on the uh, derby theater box office and uh, you can either sign up and be in person you can be socially distanced in the auditorium, it will be on the main stage, or you can join us online and you will, it will be streamed online. Fantastic. That's really exciting. That's great. Is it just going to be students that are presenting there or do we have any other practitioners who are going to be presenting research? Um, there's going to be a keynote speaker from Nathan Powell. And he um, is working with 20 Stories High and is a practitioner from Nottingham Playhouse. And he'll be talking a little bit about his work and how, uh, how he sees his work adapting and going forward uh, in the current uh, climate as well. Super. Great. Thank you. Uh, well, I'd just like to say a big thank you over for your time. Um, I know that you're extremely busy um, and I massively appreciate your time and also um, you sharing everything that you have with me this evening. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. It's been lovely to talk to you.